Today's show is brought to you by a new podcast produced by MJ Bulls Media called The Deadhead Cannabis Show. It combines great past and present cannabis music with a deep dive into the social ramification of legalization of cannabis. Download The Deadhead Cannabis Show each week from MJBulls.com, iTunes, or Spotify, and join cannabis CPA Jim Marty and cannabis attorney Larry Mishkin for classic stories from their over 150 Grateful Dead concerts and awesome insight into the future of the cannabis industry. We closed our seed round back in February, oversubscribed for that. Uh, we launched our Oregon facility, which is largely R&D with some small commercial sales. We are under construction in California, which will be our, our first major full-scale production facility. We expect to do uh, well north of 5 million clones a year out of there. From MJ Bulls Media, it's the Raising Cannabis Capital Show. I'm Dan Humiston, and on today's show, how this company identified a cannabis grow facility bottleneck long before it even existed and created a solution to solve it when it did. Today in Raising Cannabis Capital, we are joined by Kevin Brooks from Conception Nursery. Kevin, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Glad to be here. It's a cool stuff. While I was preparing for this interview, I, I kept thinking to myself, this is one of those ideas that you really need to be able to see, see around corners, actually, to recognize it. Or at least you did need to see around corners because probably when you started this, it probably wasn't super obvious that the industry was going to grow as fast as it, as it did. The, the needs of growers were going to come to the forefront this quickly. I guess before we start talking about what Conception Nursery does, it'd be helpful for me and I know it'd be helpful for a lot of our listeners if you just give us a brief education about grow facilities and specifically talk about mom room and genetics. And Sure, I'm happy to. So one of the challenges that we identified very early on is consistency. We would have five rooms where we grew in. Room one, for example, we'd have a harvest that would come out and would be 300 pounds. And then the next harvest, it would be 265 pounds. And then the next harvest, it's 315 pounds. It, the only thing consistent that we found in our harvest was that it was inconsistent. We looked at the lights. We looked at feeding, the nutrients, the water schedule, the water cleanliness, every single variable we could. And really what it came back to, is inconsistency started really in the base of supply chain. And that base of supply chain comes from what's called a mom room. There are no real cannabis nursery programs. So how do you get genetics? How do people get plants in their facilities if you can't legally go out and buy them? You go out and, and you know somebody and you have a friend of a friend or a guy and you deliver cash and they give you what's called cuts or baby clones. And those baby clones, you grow up into being moms. And those moms produce branches and you cut those branches and those branches then go into rooms that become flower and cannabis. And that, that mom room really doesn't exist anywhere else in, in any other agriculture it's because of that nature of that kind of gray market, black market history that cannabis has that this mom room exists. Okay. And it doesn't really produce any revenue. It just takes up a lot of space and I assume it's a lot of work to manage a mom room. That's right. It's a tremendous cost center. So you have specialty nutrients, specialty employees, specialty equipment. And in a lot of cases, especially in indoor grows, it's very expensive real estate. So part of our business model is helping cultivators turn that cost center into a profit center. So if you can outsource that mom room, which is typical in, in other agriculture environments, and turn it into a room where you're producing flour. You just took one of your biggest cost centers and made it a profit center. Okay. And that's where Conception Nursery comes in. Like I said before, you saw around a corner. Before anybody realized that this was going to be a problem, you guys already filled it. Yeah, we did see it uh, a while ago. It's a lot of the reasons why you're seeing some of the market correction in the Canadian stock exchanges. These big cultivation facilities are struggling to meet their projections and their pro formas largely due to the base of supply chain in these mom rooms not producing a consistent quality product. Okay. You know, one thing that is confusing to me, and I know it's confusing to a lot of people, when you say the name or the genetic, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to have the same output. There's a lot of inconsistency. Or How do you guys ensure the continuity is the same within the genetic? Great question. There's two answers to this. When you talk about the name of a genetic, Keep in mind that the genetics aren't registered. They are trademarked. So if I go out and buy Blue Dream, which is a very popular strain 
if I buy it from one cultivator and I buy it from another cultivator, they can be wildly different products because it's not regulated, because it's not registered anywhere. There's one group that we are aware of that has a certification process that certifies this is the actual genetic you're getting, and that's Phylos. And we have an exclusive with them, and they're our partners, and we do quite a bit of work with them. You know, they can actually certify that what you're buying is what you're buying. Then the second part of that question is, you know, how do I create consistency? How do I know I'm getting the same version over and over again? Well, with moms, you get slightly different versions. They'll come from different moms. Over time, you'll start to see kind of a genetic drift where cut enough from a mom and it starts producing a slightly different genetic. When you produce plants through tissue culture, what we do is we find the very best version we can of whatever strain that we're selling, whatever genetic. And then we take that down to the cell level. We clean out any of the systemic problems of that plant. And then we produce it over and over again through a sample. It's, it starts in a Petri dish and we can grow it and, and slice as many times, but it's the exact same product every single time. Okay. And the second biggest thing I would say would probably be contaminants. I know that owners of grows are fanatic because it could kill their entire company if something goes wrong with pests or disease. How do you make sure that your plants are pest and disease free? You know, I think when we talk about seeing around the corner and you kind of mentioned things that are coming up, I, I can tell you that virtually every cultivator, including myself, has experience at one time or another is pest and disease. And so when you think about where pest and disease typically comes from, we look at not only is, it, is the mom room a tremendous cost center, but we also see it as a, as a huge risk. You've got people coming in and out of there and they may or may not be properly cleaned or disinfected and they bring things in on their clothing or their hair. Most of the pest and disease start from that mom room and then carry through the rest of the facility. One of the things you get from tissue culture, it comes from a clean room, a lab environment, a sterile environment. There's no pests or disease. It's, it's essentially you're getting the cleanest product that you could possibly imagine. I, again, I know that's a, a big thing and I suspect it probably makes it better if you don't have a mom room just because, like you said, that's a, a great source of contamination. I want to take a quick break to thank all of our Raising Cannabis Capital listeners and to remind you that you can support the show by subscribing to MJ Bulls Premium. It's only $4.99 per month and you gain access to all previous Raising Cannabis Capital episodes as well as all other MJ Bulls produced podcasts and exclusive content, including companies' investor pitch decks. Go to mjbulls.com and enter promo code RAISING to get your first month free. Jumping ahead, I mean, I'm thinking if I'm a grow facility, two things come to mind when I think about outsourcing. One is I have some sort of proprietary genetics that I don't really want the world to have. That'd be my first concern. And then my second concern would be I want to make sure that if I need it, you have the inventories there because now if I don't have a mom room, I'm kind of taking a little bit of a gamble because if I need inventory and it's not available, I'm, I'm sunk. So Maybe you can walk us through how you protect us on both of those sides. So I think there's two different deliverables that we provide our customer base. Like you said, there's the generic kind of workhorse trains that we see out of the market that every grower has access to. And they're kind of these open source genetics. One of the things that we are doing with these plants is we're looking for very specific genetic traits that are pest or disease resilient or drought resilient. We have plants that have been essentially identified as resilient or resistant to those strains or those issues. So genetics that are pest disease or, or drought resistant or produce a larger yield in a shorter harvest time. So you can get more turns per year, more harvest per year. And those are our elite genetics that we are introducing in the market. Like you said, we have customers that come to us and say, hey, we have these five or six proprietary genetics. We would like you to take these down and tissue culture them and then provide us with as many cuts or as many clones as we want throughout the year and store them in a safe place. So as long as we have the proper lead time, we can produce as many cuttings as you like, as many clones as you like of whatever genetics you have in house. Okay. I mean, I think that's the answer that I'd want to hear. But so moving forward, what's next for you? Where do we go from here? Yeah, we closed our seed round back in February. Oversubscribed for that. Uh, we launched our Oregon facility, which is largely R&D with some small commercial sales. We are under construction in California which will be our, our first major full-scale production facility. We expect to do uh, well north of 5 million clones a year out of there. I'm actually currently in Massachusetts. We're looking at another facility out here. 
So for us, it's about very aggressive growth. We think that there's a wide open market right now and a a huge need. I agree with you. Everyone would agree with you. This is a land grab right now. And you mentioned that you closed your seed round in the spring. Are there or will there be opportunities for investors to participate in? Oh, most definitely. We just picked up our Series A about a week and a half ago. Certainly anyone is welcome to jump on our website, shoot us an email, and I'm happy to kind of run them through the investment thesis and financials. We'll also have all of Kevin information on our website, MJ Bill's website, and any investor information will be on that website. So, well, Kevin, good stuff. Good luck with this. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks for listening to Raising Cannabis Capital. To learn more about today's guest or to become a guest, visit our website at mjbulls.com. Today's show was produced by MJ Bulls Media, with original music produced in part by Jamie Humiston. I'm Dan Humiston, and you've been listening to the Raising Cannabis Capital Podcast.